great. Well, thanks for that introduction. I'm going to keep my options open with the lectern and this. So Steve um, gave a very, very nice talk, as you just heard. And he also described kind of the frontier of economics, which is thinking about designing markets and so on. And there's basically two things that economists do. One thing is to think about designing markets and how to make things more efficient. And another thing is just to look out in the world and describe some phenomenon that exists. So while Steve was talking about kind of the frontier, I'm going to take a little step back in time and take the approach of just trying to uh, understand and describe something. And the thing that I'm going to try and use some economics to understand is ICOs from a very basic economic perspective, okay? So I probably don't need to uh, explain to people in this room that, um, as, as my 12-year-old daughter would say, ICOs are a thing. Um, you know, they have been used very widely across all areas of the economy, okay? And there's some discussion about the degree to which, you know, they're, they're uh, fraudulent or not fraudulent in terms of raising revenues, but I think they're so widespread and have raised so much money and are so important um, that they're, they're adding some economic value to something. And the paper that, that I've written that I'm talking about today with uh, Anup Milani, who's a economist and law professor at the University of Chicago, is all about understanding exactly what economic value they are adding. And in some sense, what they do is they reduce frictions in a market. They, they reduce the transaction costs of buying and selling things in a way that's incredibly useful. They're fulfilling, if you like, a, a consumer need or an economic need by reducing those frictions. And this paradox, just to preview things, this this seeming paradox to us that is the subject of this paper is, well, what if they got really good at that? What if uh, utility tokens, platforms that issue utility tokens, could get really good at reducing transaction costs and get them down really, really close to zero? Wouldn't that be good? And the argument we make in the paper within the context of an economic model is not so much, which is that if ICOs got really good at reducing these economic frictions, then in fact they would be self-defeating in the sense that they wouldn't be able to raise any money. The value of tokens would end up going to zero. So that's the basic paradox that I'm going to speak to today. So the way I'm going to do that is to talk about two different ways that you could raise money or that one could raise money um, from providing a service. And the first is to charge a fee, just very, very standard, to charge, charge a fee for producing some kind um, uh, of, of product or, or think about the output of a, of a project. And the second thing is to sell utility tokens that could um, later be exchanged for output on a platform. So setting the optimal fee in the first model um, is, is a very, very well-studied, simple economic problem, okay? Now, the utility token policy is a little more complicated and a little more novel, and that's going to be linked to choosing um, a ledger technology. So it's going to be linked to the technology that might involve... Well, it's going to involve the choice of a consensus protocol. So it's going to involve... Uh, a choice between something like proof of stake or proof of work or some kind of hybrid of those things. And we're going to take a very reductive approach to that in terms of our economic model and we're going to represent those by a parameter, just like a number, that um, represents those a a as just validation time. But I'll, I'll become clearer about that in just a minute. Okay, and so the key thing here is going to be how much that a technology can reduce this friction in the market. And for an economist, that's where the value seems to be added. Okay, so if it, if it, if it takes 300 basis points or three, three percentage points to complete a credit card transaction, if I have a new technology can, that can do that for a third of that, for 1%, for 100 basis points, I ought to be able to capture some of that value. It's good, for, it's good for everyone in the economy for me doing that, and I ought to be able to get some share of that, and that's, in some sense, the promise of utility tokens. And if I can do that, then I might be able to sell those things uh, you know, up front and, and capture some of that value in a capitalized way. So 
um, what I'm going to do is take a very simple, basic economic model. So one of my, my favorite economists, uh, Joan Robinson, who was an interlocutor of Keynes, a British economist, uh, you know, several decades ago, said words to the effect of um, a map on a scale of one to one is no use at all. Okay, so we've got a map on a scale of one to one. It's called the world. It's very complicated. It's hard for most of us, or at least people like me, to understand. So I'm just going to build a very simple map that leaves out a lot of things, makes a bunch of assumptions, but tries to illuminate this basic tension or trade-off uh, that is present at about issuing utility tokens. So I'm going to think about a marketplace for a, for a good where there are lots of consumers and lots of producers. And without loss of generality, I'm going to assume that each consumer just demands or wants to buy one unit of this good. Okay, And I'm going to assume that before our platform uh, firm, which is kind of the, the, the sort of hero of this story, enters uh, the economy, there's some trade in some pre-existing marketplace that has some friction. And I'll, I'll represent that by the number capital F. So think about that as like before I come in with some new technology, it already costs 300 basis points to transact using credit cards transactions. So that would be like F would be three percentage points. Okay, and that friction operates just like a per unit sales tax, except that the proceeds are burned. Instead of going to the, to the government or um, someone who, who, t who takes that, a merchant maybe who takes that, just think of this tax, it's, it's a friction, it's wasted, it's, it's economically inefficient. So you can think of that as a tax where we just take the tax revenue and set it on fire. Okay, now given that friction, capital F, there's going to be some demand in this market and there's going to be some supply in this market. And the main thing that economics teaches us is that market forces are going to lead demand to be equated with supply. So if I just write down what supply is and write what demand is and take account of this friction F, it ought to be that in equilibrium, supply and demand uh, turn out to be, to be equalized, okay? Now, now think about the platform firm who comes into this market, and again, just to be simple, we imagine there's just one of these, so they're a, they're a monopolist, so they don't have to worry about any strategic interactions they might have with other platform firms, although that's an important and interesting question that I've thought about in other work, but for now, we're just gonna focus on them as a unitary actor. And what they've got is they've got a good idea. And their good idea allows them to reduce frictions in this market from big F, 300 basis points or so in my little contrived example, to something less than that little F, okay? And now to do that, they gotta build some infrastructure. So they gotta pay some fixed cost, I'll call that I, like I for investment cost or something like that. But the marginal cost of operating this marketplace is gonna zero, so it'd be zero. So their only, economic problem is how they're going to finance this investment cost I. And I'm going to be agnostic about whether the underlying project that needs to be finance employs blockchain technology or, 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 or some other technology. What I am going to insist on, and in the paper, this is why it's assumption 3.2, just on the off chance you ever look at the paper, that matches to the assumption that we make in the paper, that the cost of implementing the underlying project is going to be the same regardless of what revenue model the firm chooses. So there's this cost I, this investment cost that has to be paid, that doesn't depend on whether they choose this fee-for-service model or whether they choose the utility token model, okay? Now, what I want to do now is just consider these two different models. So I'm going to go through them in turn. The first thing I'm going to do is consider the transaction fee model. I'm going to figure out what the optimizing behavior for the firm is under that model. Then I'm gonna look at the utility token model, figure out what the optimizing behavior under that is, and then think about the ultimately somewhat interesting question is which one would the firm like to choose? Which model would they like to choose? Fee-for-service or utility tokens, depending on the underlying economic parameters of the environment. And what I'm gonna try and convince you of is that there's there's a trade-off. In some circumstances, the fee-for-service model is gonna 
be more attractive and in other circumstances, the utility token model is gonna be more attractive and then right at the end, we'll get to some of the more design features about how you might wanna, if you could control the environment a little bit, how, how you might wanna change the environment to, ma to make one or e either of these more attractive. Okay, so the firm can charge a fee, I'll call that K, and that's going to be bounded by the economic value that they add. What is that? Well, that's, that's about how much they reduce the friction or the transaction costs in the market. So remember that there was this ingoing, say, 300 basis points, big F amount of friction in the market. They've got a new technology that reduces it down to little f, and they could, I said they could capture some of that value. Well, they can't really get more of that, otherwise they're destroying value, not adding it. So there's some limitation on the fee that they can charge, and that's where that inequality k is less than uh, big F minus little f. Um, and the fee that they charge is gonna make consumers demand less of something, because it's like raising the price or adding a tax to something. And so we can just think about, okay, what's the discounted present value of these fees? They're gonna be able to charge these fees forever more into the future. So what's, um, what's the present value of those fees? And we can just write that down and that's in that third bullet point, that's, that's the sum of those fees there. Now when demand doesn't fluctuate over time, which from now on I'm gonna assume for the, for the rest of this talk, if demand's stable, then we can just write down that, that stream of future revenues in a, very, in a very simple form, and you'll see that written just there. Okay, so now, what's this firm got? It's got some stream of revenues that is relatively stable over time, doesn't fluctuate. It ought to be able to monetize, the, monetize uh, those revenues, right? It ought to be able to sell them. And here, what they could do is they could sell some fraction of that fee revenue fee, and I'm going to um, put a little superscript there for transaction fee, uh, under this model, it could sell them to outside investors to fund their infrastructure, their investment cost I. Okay, so what does the firm do? Well, the firm's got a pretty straightforward maximization problem. It's going to get to keep whatever, whatever fraction of that free revenue it doesn't sell. Okay, so that's that fraction there. It sells, uh, that, that's the fee revenue there, and it's subject to the constraint that it can't charge too high a fee, K. Uh, it can only charge a fee up to the economic value that it creates. So that's its maximization problem. And we can write that down and, and optimize that, and it's going to involve a trade-off, and that trade-off, uh, it turns out it depends on very standard economic concept called an, an elasticity, which is really just a percentage change in one thing for another thing. And the trade-off here is that raising its fee, it's trying to figure out what's the optimal fee to charge. So the firm is gonna think, well, what if I make it a little bit more? What if I make it a little bit less? How do I get it just right? So raising the fee by 1% is gonna increase the revenue per transaction by 1%, but it's obviously also going to decrease the number of transactions because it, it reduces demand. Okay, now the optimal fee is going to balance those effects and it's going to set this percentage change or elasticity, elasticity of this transaction effect equal to one. Now, as advertised, that's one way of doing things. That's one economic model. Another way of doing things is to issue utility tokens. So the platform could mint tokens and require all trade on the platform to take place in tokens and then sell some of those tokens. That's essentially the economics of what an ICO is. And then again, we're gonna make this technological assumption that this happens essentially all upfront. Okay, now there are gonna be some frictions in the trade of the underlying good and what we're going to be interested in here, of course, as the firm would be, is in the value of the tokens that it sells. Okay, so the price that it can charge for a token is going to depend on these frictions. That's the economic value that it's adding, is reducing frictions. And the more that it reduces frictions, the more it ought to be able to charge. So think of that as just grabbing 
some share of that three percentage point fee, in a sense. And of course, it, it's going to mint some number of tokens M. Okay? So if the token has positive value, which, you know, is the interesting case, then the firm can also sell some of those tokens to investors to finance its investment costs, the cost of establishing the platform, for instance. <coughs> Pardon me. So it can sell a fraction fee, and the superscript here is UT for utility token, of the utility tokens right up front to finance that investment. Now, here the choice is not the fee as it was in the, in the fee-for-service model, so before the firm was choosing little, little k, here the choice is the consensus protocol, okay? And again, I'm gonna take this very reductive view of what the consensus protocol is and say all that does is it induces some validation time. And I'm gonna parameterize that by a number. And so, you know, people in this room w would have a much more sophisticated view than I do um, about, ab about those protocols. And I'm just gonna say all it does is it induces some validation time. Okay, now people who mine Coin say on a, on, a, on a blockchain are going to need to be compensated for that, so we we take account of that. And the key concept here is going to be the velocity of the exchange of tokens. So these tokens are like a currency; they're going to move around in this little mini economy. And what we're going to be interested in is how quickly they move around. And so we're going to denote velocity velocity by the letter v and it's going to be related inversely to the validation time. Okay, now it doesn't have to be linear in that way, it could, it could work a lot of different ways, but just to keep things simple, we're gonna, we're gonna write it this way. Now once again, in the equilibrium of any market or any economy, we're gonna expect supply and demand to come together, to be equated, and so here, we need the, the um, demand and supply of everything happening in this little economy to be equal. And we just write that out again. And that leads us to be able to say, okay, so what's the, what's the price of utility tokens? And how does it depend on these underlying economic parameters? And the key thing that's of interest to us here is what happens if we take this validation time to zero, so we increase the velocity of circulation. And this is what lies behind the, 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 the title and the idea of this, of this paper, which is to say, you'd think that, and you know, there's reason to believe this, you'd think that reducing frictions with these tokens is kind of the purpose of having the tokens. That's the economic purpose of them, and that's good. But there's a kind of dark side to that as well for the uh, putative utility token issuer, which is if I make these things incredibly efficient, then these tokens circulate really, really fast around the economy, so I don't need as many of them. So think about a kind of reductio ad absurdum where there's this one, we only need one token because you know I use it for a nanosecond, then Steve picks it up and he uses it to conduct his business for a nanosecond and then passes it to Stephanie for a nanosecond and it, there's just this one token that's circulating infinitely quickly around this entire economy. How much can I sell that for? That's the, that's the key question here. So as I do what I, I, I think is adding economic value, which is reducing frictions, does that cut the other way in a sense, which is does it reduce what I can sell this thing for? And it turns out, when you write that down, you think about supply and demand, think about what I could sell the token for, and I take the limit, so I say, what if frictions, so validation time uh, as measured by S, what if I take the friction to zero, what's the limit of the price, the equilibrium price that I can sell a utility token for? It turns out that also goes to zero. That's not so good. If my revenue is price times quantity, P times M, and P is going to zero, uh, you know, revenue is not so good if P is zero. Uh, and that highlights this idea, and this is kind of the, the, the only real idea in the paper, 
is that I'm going to want to have some positive level of friction. So if I do my job of reducing frictions too well, I'm not going to be able to monetize that in any meaningful way. I'm not going to be able to sell these tokens for any amount of money. So I want to do something. Otherwise, there's no point in people, consumers or producers using a utility token. I better add some value, but in some sense, I better not add too much. I better not reduce frictions too much. And that, that leads to a bunch of of interesting questions that come from that, okay? And so you can write down what it looks like for the optimizing amount of that friction, um, and, and we can really just make the point about how that links to minor compensation that I just, that I just made. Um, and then you can ask the question of, okay, so how does this depend on the underlying economic environment? And it turns out there are these two effects that are going on here, and it's based on the idea that reducing frictions is good, it facilitates more economic activity, but on the other hand, reducing frictions is bad because it reduces the amount of money that I can get for selling these tokens. And the optimal way of reducing those frictions is gonna balance those two competing effects. So it turns out that if the elasticity, the percentage change of this revenue effect is smaller than the elasticity of this velocity effect, how fast this stuff circulates, then at that point improving the efficiency of the utility token is gonna, is, is gonna lead to me generating less revenue, okay? So it's gonna depend, the, the, the degree to which I reduce frictions is gonna depend on the underlying economic environment. Now, part of the point of this is to say, well, if you're a, a budding ICO issuer, what should you do? Should you issue utility tokens or should you, uh, you know, just adopt a transaction fee model? So we can compare those two things in the context of this model. And again, it's going to depend all on how users in this market, I think of them as consumers, uh, respond to this reduction in, in frictions. And so we can compare those things the implication of that is a firm is going to control this by setting minor compensation, and they're going to set it in a way where the uh, price elasticity of demand, the percentage change uh, for, for a, uh, in demand for a percentage change in price, is less than one, okay? Now, this also leads to, I think, a useful observation, which is, that there is one meaningful difference in the two models in terms of setting a transaction fee versus selling utility tokens. And that difference is in what the firm needs to know. So if you're, if you're selling utility tokens, the firm has to have knowledge about the consumer demand and the underlying technology. They have to know about the validation technology. They, have to, they don't have to dictate, say, proof of stake versus proof of work, but they have to know how that operates because how, how efficiently that operates is fundamental to their business model. Whereas if you're just setting fee for service, you don't have to know nearly as much. So if you think that you live in a world where you don't know those things or they fluctuate over time, for instance, then a more robust economic model is just fee-for-service. It's kind of boring, but it's more robust to big shocks in the economic environment or lack of knowledge of the economic environment. Okay, so if you're using, if you're issuing utility tokens, you need to know more and that, you know, you may be able to know more, there may be clever ways of you finding out more, and that's all good, but it imposes an extra burden on you. And economists like me who worry about the robustness of the mechanisms that you're using to sell things uh, tend to worry about the informational burden that one bears from having to know things like that. So we can compare these revenue models um, using this little economic model, and it turns out that you know we can precisely characterize the trade-off between using utility tokens uh, in terms of the amount of revenue it generates or using transaction fees. And it depends 
on these underlying economic parameters. So there's a lot of notation there, but all it's really saying is it depends on the velocity of circulation of the tokens, and it depends on how consumers demand goods as the fees change. So it's really just linked to the very basic economics of the problem, okay? And there's a trade-off between those two things. So if velocity is sufficiently low, then the utility token model is good. That makes sense to me, which is that if what you can do is add value by making these things circulate faster, basically creating uh, a, a more economic value by making things circulate faster, then that's going to be good. But if you go too far in that direction, you're going to be able to monetize these things um, for less. So the, the firm thinking about an ICO is going to want to search for some kind of protocol that lowers the elasticity of validation time on minor compensation. And this is where we get a little bit into the design aspect rather than the description aspect of this problem and start thinking about, okay, um, is there a way that we can mitigate this sort of paradoxical effect that comes from issuing utility tokens. And very briefly, um, in, the, in the paper, we consider three different ways of doing that. And so I, the way I think about this is, you know, how can we think a little laterally to kind of move out the technological frontier? Okay, so one thing we could do is we could tokenize the transaction fees. So we could say, well, you've got these transaction fees, there's no reason why we couldn't issue a token based on those fees. The second thing is something that a bunch of platforms already do, which is issue a, a work token or require miners to hold utility tokens while they're mining. And the third thing is, is, is what's known um, as burn and mint, which is the platform um, holds token be tokens between transactions. And it turns out some of those things work okay and some of those things work not so well. So tokenizing the transaction fees really just kind of like punts the problem down the road. This is requiring the fee to be paid in newly created tokens. Now that doesn't, that doesn't solve an obvious economic problem. There are really no trust or cost issues here with paying a fee. So this is just introducing you know, more sand into the, into the mill here and, and increasing frictions. So that doesn't really solve any economic problem um, and in fact, it might exacerbate the negative relationship between lower minor compensation and higher velocity. So, you know, our conclusion is that's not going to be a, a meaningful way to, to solve this problem. The second idea is this, is this work token idea where the firm uses, say, proof of stake and requires miners to stake tokens that are used for um, payments uh, to earn the right to write the next block on the blockchain. So, you know, some prediction markets, uh, uh, some, some other platforms like Filecoin and Keep, um, Livepeer, Truebit, and so on, use this, um, use this model. So this is, a, this is a thing that people do, it's well known. In the context of our little economic model, what that does is it really lowers the ratio of transaction cost to velocity. Okay, so proof of stake lowers transaction costs relative to proof of work. Now, whether it offers a better ratio of um, minor cost to velocity, which is what drives things in our economic model, that's what's important for mitigating this ICO paradox, that's less clear. That ratio depends on the duration of time that miners are required to stake tokens for. Now, um, in some sense, that's a design variable, but in any case, proof of stake doesn't get you out of this bad box of the negative relationship between minor compensation and velocity. So that seems, at least in the context of our economic model, less promising. Now, this burn and mint idea, the idea that the platform holds tokens between transactions, that's, that's operating directly on basically how large this friction is. So that holds some more promise, um, and again, that's used in certain applications that, that we talk about here. 
And the key idea to this is that by introducing a delay between the use of the token uh, to purchase a good and the time it's reintroduced, effectively increases validation time. So in my, in my contrived example, I said Steve can use his token for a nanosecond, then I grab the token, use it for a nanosecond, and then pass it to, to Stephanie. If I required there to be a little lapse in time between those things, that would slow things down enough. That destroys value, but it might destroy just enough value that the token's worth something that I can sell it for. So what we've done is taken a very, very basic, very simple economic model and said, okay, let's think about utility tokens. What do they do? Okay, they add value by reducing frictions. What if they were super successful at that goal and reduce frictions down to zero? Would they be worth anything? And the answer in the context of our model is no, they would not. They would not be worth anything. So if you believe that model of the world, then you'd say, well, they shouldn't be raising billions of dollars a year. They shouldn't be raising more money than you know, all venture financing uh, in certain quarters. Uh, there'd have to be something else going on. But it also points to some of these design features that one could utilize to make these things work better, and those were the sort of three ideas I explored at the end. Thanks very much.